All right, uh, so let's kick off. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the session on harnessing customer obsession to fuel growth, BP's digital innovation journey. Without ado, let's kick this off. I'm conscious some people might still be joining in, but we'll start with some quick introductions. And uh, my name is Sapna Maheshwari. I lead the customer experience service line for ThoughtWorks in the UK. I'm joined by my co-host Ala Simoner from AWS. Ala leads the strategic global operations for AWS's digital innovation program. We are truly delighted to have with us today Des Johnson, VP of Customer Experience and Digital Product Delivery, and Andre Holtz, Global Digital Product Manager from BP. Thank you, Des and Andre, so much for joining us today. Before we kick off the Firesat chat, a quick introduction to ThoughtWorks for those of you who might not be familiar with us. We are a global technology consultancy. We are over 9,000 people across 48 offices in 17 countries. We're truly passionate about driving innovation through integrating strategy, design, and engineering. And over the last 25 years, we've helped our clients solve complex business problems by bringing them closer to the customer and using technology as the differentiator. We are also an advanced consulting partner of AWS, and we've been collaborating together, enabling organizations with their transformation agenda across modernization, innovation, and customer experience. Ala and I are very excited to be co-hosting this webinar to discuss BP's innovation journey with Des and Andrew today. A few housekeeping rules before we start. Everybody's automatically muted, so don't worry. Uh, you can add a question at any time using the Q&A function below. We will hold off and answer these questions at the end of our fireside chat, but hopefully we've left enough time for us to answer all of your questions. So please get them in as you think about it uh, while you're listening to Des and Andre. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we will share it with you afterwards. And should you need them, there are live captions available, uh, which you can access by clicking the CC icon that you should see on your screen. BP's journey. And BP as an organization has seen tremendous shifts in the marketplace, the move from gasoline to electricity, the shift to renewables, increased customer expectation amidst the growing consciousness around energy. And in the face of these shifts, remaining relevant has meant innovating and reinventing oneself. And this, this clearly has been very, very relevant to BP, which is why, um, you know, once again, Thank you so much, Des and Andre, for joining us. And it's a pleasure having you both. And as we kick off the fireside chat, Des, the first question I wanted to start with is, if you could share a bit more with our audience about the impact these macro industry trends have had, what it has meant for BP, and how you embarked upon this innovation journey centered around customers. Mm. No, thank you, Satna. And, uh... You know, thank you everybody for, for joining. Um, please do ask questions as you go. It will make it much more interesting and fun for all of us as well. Um, just taking a step back in terms of the sort of change process that BP and actually society is going through at the moment. It, it's true. The world needs an energy transition and BP, we believe, has a really pivotal role to play in that energy transition as we move to a much lower, less carbon intense world, ultimately with a goal of, of achieving net zero, not only for ourselves and, and within our operations, but for the operations of our, our customers and partners and communities in which we operate. And when you think about that change, and, and we started on that strategic shift uh, probably about 18 months ago, February 2020 was, was when our new chief executive announced what he talked about as the reinvention of BP. Actually, it drives a couple of quite fundamental shifts as it relates to customers and it relates to, to innovation. So the first is that it really forces us to change the way we think about ourselves and move from being what we've typically described as an international oil company, a big commodities, you know, find it, extract it, trade it, refine it, sell it, you know, commodities and products kind of engineering organization into a services and therefore customer centric organization. So we talk about the shift 
for us being from international oil company to integrated energy company. And, you know, the integration part can only happen when we bring product services and offer together for our customers. So that's really demanded that we think in a very different way about the role that serving the customer plays. They're no longer a sort of an outlet for what we've got to sell and they become really the driving force and the focal point of the services we need to provide. And it, these things, you know, from the outside might not look that significant, but having been in the company sort of 16 odd years, the fact we've got a board member now, main board member in Emma Delaney, that's got customers in her title. She's the executive vice president for customers and products. We've never had that before in, you know, 100 years of company history. We're now starting to declare and communicate customer targets, customer KPIs, as part of our external reporting. Again, never done that before. These are the sort of first steps and, 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 and baby steps that we're taking towards becoming a much more customer centric place. It's a long journey, right? It's not gonna happen overnight, um, but it's something that we, we've started on. And then I think just second part of your question was about the kind of the innovation journey. And, Innovation has been part of what we have been about for, for a very long time. And I'll link it specifically to, to digital. I mean, I was leading a, a digital innovation program when I was part of our Castrol business, kind of 2014, 2015. But what we had were pockets. We had little pockets of goodness, small programs, small activities, limited scope that started to show value. And what we're really starting to transition to now i think is a much bigger ambition in terms of the the digital transformation that we need to make for our customers so we've reorganized ourselves we've changed the way that we partner between the business and myself and andre come from a, a business background the way that we partner with our, our it teams what we call our innovation and engineering teams and really trying to make sure in our operating model we're bringing both innovation continuous improvement and importantly, the voice of the customer right into the heart of what we do. So, sorry, long answer to a, an opening question, but hopefully help set the scene a little bit. No, that is excellent. And Des, I think what, what was very interesting that you talked about was one, the courageous leader as your CEO setting the new direction, but also, um, you know, this part that you talked about having customer metrics, now something that you've brought front and center. Can you talk a little more about that? Because that's quite interesting. Often people are, you know, very busy measuring business outcomes, but when you make customer outcomes front and center, what, what did that mean when you introduced that? So, so there's a couple of things really. One is it, it genuinely signals to the outside world and importantly, internally, the type of organization we want to be. So we've been, we, and by the way, we remain financially outcome driven as well, right? So it's it's not that delivering value to our shareholders has stopped mattering. It's just now we recognize it's an and conversation. And what that forces us to do is changing the nature of the conversation we're having in, you know, some of our internal conversations. I think about the, the meetings that I take part in now. It's It's now very normal in a way which wasn't really the case before that we're saying, well, where's our customer validation for that? Or what's the growth in customer numbers? And are we seeing the evidence that, you know, we're differentiating versus competition in the eyes of the customer? And how happy are our customers? Have we got a measurement for that? And that those are not the kinds of questions we would have been asked by previous leaders. We would have been asked questions about delivery versus project milestone or compliance with a budget framework or financial outcomes. Now customer outcomes is, is forming part of that part of that conversation. And, and you know, I think that's a trend that you will see as we go forward. You'll start to hear more and more about customer success alongside the kind of financial growth and, and energy transition of, of the company. So more, more to come. I would also say I would say looking into to the customer success. KPI that we have defined. I think this is a bit of, I would say, a sustainable way on success if you're starting with the customer. And in, in the end, this will result in also financial 
success. Because I think financial success you can easily create on a short term, on a quarter base. But I would say if you would like to create something sustainably, and there are examples in the market where this didn't happen, um, like like Nokia is one of the probably most um, I would say obvious examples where I think when you're losing really the customer focus, you are somewhere really losing also your your business business aim, and this is where it's always helping to focus on the customer. Yeah, I love that, Andre. What you said there is focus on the customer, and the financial metrics will automatically show you the results. That's that's so pertinent and true. But also, I think last comment on this, but it takes time. So I think and this is something that also I would say, say say that we are learning still. It's not the case that I would say if you're starting to focus on the cost of today, tomorrow the ARCOP will flow in. And also, I think this is a conversation that we all re- always had with our products when, when talking about to senior stakeholders. They expect results quickly and more, I would say, in what's what are you delivering in ARCOP next month or the month after and not so about okay let's try to start with an mvp or think like that we're coming to this a bit later but i think this is also important that it's not i would say easily coming through and this is more long-term run a marathon more than really a a, a really short run thank you andre and des and i i am curious because this is either there's like a lot of magic in this but as you think about this pretty tremendous effort and shift in your business that's just recently taken place. I I think the one question that, you know, of course, is pressing in my mind is how do you know where to begin or how to prioritize some of those innovation efforts? And so it'd be helpful if you can maybe give us a bit of a sense of kind of how did this all begin and was there a, a specific discovery, you know, a customer discovery process that you embarked upon and what kind of findings came out of it and how did that inform your strategy mm. of where to begin? Yeah, I, I, there's a real danger of trying to sort of boil the ocean on this stuff, right, if that phrase translates. But honestly, I think the important thing is just pick somewhere to start, almost anywhere, right? It really doesn't matter that much. Um, go to the places that you already know are sources of customer pain or customer opportunity. If you want to figure out the things you need to get better at for customers and their experiences, read your app store reviews, go to Trustpilot, go sit with your customer care center for a day and listen to calls. And you will get 20 ideas of places where you could make a difference quite quickly. And we're, if I just link it back to that, I hinted at, you know, my involvement in this really started 2014, 2015, and we we knew in Castrol at the time, we knew we were uh, not delivering the customer experience that we needed to deliver for our, our distributor partners, right? So that's kind of where we took as our first start point, our distributor partners and, and ultimately their, their workshop. So it was a kind of B to B to C model, um, if that makes sense. And we knew because our insight surveys were telling us, but we weren't really doing much about it. So we just carved a space. We said, we're going to focus on a few key personas. We're going to do some journey mapping and design think uh, discovery. I, at the time, I'm not sure we knew it was discovery, but that's kind of what we did. We, we followed good design thinking practices. We created a whole stack of ideas that we thought could make life better. And genuinely, we picked three off the top of the pile and we said, let's see if we can make these real, get an MVP to market and get some traction. And, and kind of to the point that Andre made, there's, there's a danger of sort of over-promise, under-deliver on this. We're going to do a company-wide innovation program and we're going to put 50 million into it and it'll be amazing and it'll pay back in 10 years. I'd much rather spend you know tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to just prove hey we did this we did this for 50 customers and 45 out of 50 customers are now happier as a result of it and use that as a way to build confidence to do more go bigger so i'm, I'm a big believer in kind of stop talking stop thinking start doing and just you know and if you can't figure out where to start ask your customers and they will tell you right? In words of one syllable where you need to be better. So that's, that's kind of what I would do. And I mean, Andre, I don't know what your, yep. you know, experience within the market's been. 
I would say it's it's relatively similar. So I'm I'm the product manager for Manaral. Manaral is a customer engagement platform for Aral with a fuel spread in Germany here, um, and this is about really getting getting service to our our sites um, for for the customer. And and when when I would say I started to be a product manager, we had a backlog of uh, I wouldn't it wouldn't be part of a backlog. We had a list of 50, 60 features that we would all like to bring into one app. And, and talking to the marketing teams, to the sales team. I think this, the idea was to bring this up in the next two years time, put millions of development hours, time, money into this development and publish an app in two years time. And this was the point, we tried this for two or three years, but we never came to, to I would say, a, a really tipping point where we were able to execute it because the trust was not there. Also the time was long, the budget commitment was relatively long. And, and then I think we had conversations and, and thought about, okay, could we do this not a bit differently? And this was about the moment where we got in touch with ThoughtWorks because they have done a great work in US and, and they were onboarded into, into Manara in Germany. And then we started, as, as Des mentioned also for us, with the discovery phase. And for us, it was very important at the very beginning to understand what we are not doing. <laughs> and also being very clear, okay, let's slice it in pieces which are showing an end-to-end -end customer journey, but not trying, as we said, boil the ocean. I think try to pick something out that you are able to deliver. We were able to deliver our MVP, and I would call it releasable MVP, within three months' time to the stores. And afterwards, I would say the success started because we were able to talk to the customer. Um, and I think this is, I would say, my, my big insight out of this time also was, I would say we had some conversation with customer interviews, as you already mentioned, some infos that we got from, from the sales teams or from the, from, the, from the service hotlines. But in the end, the real value of getting customer voices came when we launched the app into the stores. Because immediately, if you listen to the customer, you get so many insights that you really are able to, I would say, directly update your, your backlog and update your priorities. And you need to be open to do so. I think if you're then adding up, say, okay, but I already defined the 10 next steps after the MVP, you get lost because in the end, your, your customer will tell you what is important. One example, I think when we launched the Man Aral app to the stores in February, we got immediate response from the customer that don't like the registration flow because it's not working for them. They don't want to give so many data at the very beginning of the process without using the app. So in, it, in two weeks time or three weeks time, we completely reshuffled the whole backlog focusing only on resolving this customer issue, which was popping up, and put an updated version into the stores three weeks after. And we did this in the first two months' time. We did this slice. So we really only played this out to 10% of the legacy app, which was only a side finder. So we really, I would say, validated our insights, validated the customer insights with our product and get better release over release. And this, I think, is important. Thank you, Andre. Uh, that was very insightful in terms of how you took on the journey for real with me and Aral. Uh, so just I'm curious, as you went on the journey and you talked about how, uh, you know, there was this mindset of let's get all these features in and let's let's get this full product out. What were some of the fundamental changes you needed to drive to align the leadership or your stakeholders and take them on the journey? And what were some of the barriers that you found and how, how did you overcome them? Yeah, I would say one of the barriers is for sure that I think we are all coming more from a um, waterfallish organization. So it's really about milestones. What are you able to deliver next year, the next quarter, in two years' time? And honestly, still, I'm coming today from a conversation where I'm again in this conversation. Please tell me what you're delivering 2022 and put in a list of features that you are delivering until the end of the year where I can say, sorry, I can't do it. And this is something that I think we are all on a learning curve. And even though that probably some people still build up the trust, which I think is important, that they're trusting you in what you're doing, you will hear and they fall back into the old behaviors. And this will happen maybe over years. I'm not sure when this will stop. But I think for me, and this is what we did with the, so get started build up the MVP, and then get the trust from the from the senior stakeholders. This will enable you to give you the freedom to develop further. And I think also for me, it's important things like, so we started from the very beginning, we moved away from steering boards or governance boards. It was more like our senior leadership team is there to support us get our things done. So we call it an executive action team meeting rather than a steering board. They are there 
and tomorrow is also a meeting where it's only about unblocking our work to get our work done for the customer and for the product. And I think these, I would say, are two learnings or three learnings that I would say is, is important. Um, but, but also, we are still on that journey. One of the, I, I mean, just to, to echo, and I think, I mean, Andre's living it day in, day out, right? Um, is making this visible and inclusive to your stakeholders is really important. And you can do that in lots of ways. But the benefit of doing that is trust, confidence, the ability to, you know, seek support. So things like showcases or demos, right? Andre runs an open showcase and demo every couple of weeks, which has an invite list of, I mean, pretty much anybody that wants to be there, right? And that's as a, as a senior stakeholder, that's your opportunity to be in the process, seeing the progress, ask your questions, Hey, Andre, where's that on the roadmap? Which is that coming forward? Where's the customer validation? What are the risks or issues that you're hitting? And you become part of the process. So it's not something that you sort of sit back from. It happens two years later, somebody comes back on a box and you've miraculously got a, a product. Um, you're, you're in it. You're actively working alongside the team. And I, I you know, I talk about my role in this is kind of trying to get people out of Andre's way so we can get the work done. Now, one of the ways that we try and do that, there is a lot of um, focus on the innovation activities can go into kind of process or technology or whatever. I think the key to making change though is, is mindset and behaviors, right? So there is a cultural change aspect to this and, and needed and if i think about i mean i'm smiling Alec, because i'm looking at you on the call one of the senior stakeholders that i was working with in, in one of these exec action teams we'd been developing a product and it was like we just couldn't get this thing out the door because like every time we tried to move it was like well we just need one more feature and one more and it's not yet competitive it's not your competitive and in the end, I had a heart to heart with this person. And he said, look, Des, I only want to launch it when it's finished. And I said, when was Amazon finished? Right. When, when, when did Amazon sit back and go, it's now done? Like they do, it, this thing changes every day. And the power of digital innovation is the ability to, to have shippable product rapidly right? Multiple iterations. We don't do it this rapidly, but I talked to a financial organization that were pushing something like 50 changes live every day, 50 times a day, their product experience changed. Now we're nowhere near that, but Andre, we're probably doing a release to market either with a bug fix or new functionality every couple of weeks, every week. I mean, it's yep, every couple of weeks. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, but, but what, what needs to happen to make that possible? Yes, technology is important. Yes, process is important. But the leadership mindset that embraces risk and change. And do you know what, Andre? Release it to the market. And if the customers don't like it, we can roll it back and change it in two weeks' time. It's okay. That's the kind of mindset shift. And too often innovation efforts or transformation efforts, I think, think the answer lies in process or technology. And I don't think it does. I've, I've never found process or technology to be the thing that trips us up. It is mindset behaviors and outlook that are the things that trip us up. Maybe one additional comment. I think you mentioned showcase. I think this is something which is really crucial and, and thank you for, for making this note, Des. I think, I, I think always be inclusive in these showcases, as you rightly said. I think our list is probably about 100 participants. And if someone would like to attend the showcase, let him attend the show, to let her attend the, the showcase. So really trying to get people, I would say, associated to your product and be inclusive with, with other people. And also I would say, if you're developing features together with the, com with the, with the customer, um, with the consumer, it's also important to get the ownership in, in the associated businesses. It should not be ending up that you are as a product manager developing the product. And I, I call it sometimes that business is throwing features over the fence to say, let's do it, come back in half a year. And then I would like to, to validate if this is working. I think 
include them from the very beginning, let them be part of your team of your product development. And this is how we are building up inception phases. There was always a strong association with the business, but also with, with our um, IT team, our innovation and engineering team to help us build this, I would say inclusive one team approach from the very beginning and share also the, the responsibilities um, of, of the product in the end. No, it's really fascinating. And I, you know, Andres, I hear like the, the feedback here and does regarding like cultural change. We're talking about like many things here. There's like this appetite for risk. How, I guess my first question really is, this was a big shift in your organization. You know, Andre, you talk about 60 items in a backlog and Andre, you talk about new assumption and changes in leadership. Like how, like, what did it take to get to the point where you are today to be able to have that appetite for risk? Because ultimately, if you want to move products and you want to deliver into like, you know, products to customers and delight them, you need to move quickly. So what was that like trigger in your business that helped to unlock that part of the business? So the truth is, you know, we're not there yet, right? We're not sitting here today because we've cracked it all and we've got the code, right? But we're on, we're a cliche, but we're on the journey. But I think what I found, the thing that helped unlock like the chink in the armor, right, was um, something that actually a professional gambler said to us. We, we company um, event, we actually had a professional gambler come in um, who spoke to us about attitude to risk. And one of the things that he said that really rang true with me was he talked about minimizing the cost of failure, not the rate of failure. So his mindset very much was, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in betting lots of times and winning a lot, but small. So, and, and when I lose, I lose small. So this model of, you know, I only make big bets and some win and some, he was like, no, no, what I'm trying to do is learn the game, right? So that I maximize my chance of success. And I do that by having lots of not very costly failures. And we actually applied that into our innovation program. So for the first 18 months, having gone through this discovery process, generated backlog of ideas, we created 18 prototypes, MVPs, in 18 months. We, we ran at a rate of roughly one a month. And when we started, we were investing probably quarter of a million dollars and three months of effort to get something that was a bit of working software in the market. But we then set ourselves the challenge of going, how can we minimize that investment without reducing the learning? And we started moving to things like clickable prototypes, right? Which were costing us, you know, maybe $10,000, right? But for the validation with customers, that was good enough, right? Because we were killing them. We, of those 18, only six really proved valuable enough to make us want to, to move forward. And, and so over time, we focused on minimizing the cost of failure, not the rate of failure. We, we celebrated and made visible the things that didn't work. We always went in with KPIs and means of measurement. So we, we never hid from, this is the goal, and it either met it or it didn't meet it. And, if, and you know, we would have a good quality conversation around that. And you kind of get creative. I mean, we, you know, we faked a chatbot one time, right? Where, you know, instead of spending God knows how long it would have taken to develop or deploy a chatbot, we faked it by having a couple of people in a call center pretending to be a chatbot for two weeks to help us understand what were the real questions real customers asked most of the time if you gave them chatbot functionality. So that, we got creative about, so, so we tried to do lots limited time limited cost and therefore when they fail and they will you haven't bet the house on it and that for us that kind of unlocked it because then actually people i mean people want to be creative people want to do new things and beat the competition and see something you know change a customer experience but they're just the quest for perfection and completeness slows you down right so if you can get pace and minimize the cost whilst getting the learning that for us that well i'm not sure it was a trigger 
but that and then it starts snowballing we did it in one place we did it another somebody came in and said hey how are you doing that Andre said it before how do we end up doing it in Germany we'd been talking about launching a new experience for two years and never got anywhere but ThoughtWorks had helped us with some design work in the US we did it in Germany we set ourselves a goal of getting a new app to market in three months and we hit it right and that that kind of thing's transformational because people are going in the background, they're all sitting there going, they'll never do it. <laughs> I know they say three months, but that's, they'll, it'll never be three months. Well, guess what? It was. Guess what? It worked. And guess what? A lot of customers liked it. And a lot of customers said it could be even better if you did this instead. Great. Well, then now we're on that treadmill. Right. So, sorry, I'll shut up. I'm talking too much about that. No, this is excellent. And I, I think there is something about deploying these minimal lovable products. Like it's nice in practice. I know it's also challenging and there's many, I think, barriers that could be in the way, but there's also something wonderful, right? You create that flywheel effect. Once you prove success once, it can continue to accelerate adoption and change mindsets in your business and help foster that innovation culture. And so maybe I, where I'd love to maybe take a moment of pause here is, you know, for the participants who are on the line, it would be interesting, just as a moment of reflection, we'd like to do a quick survey and, and understand kind of how do you feel or how confident do you feel about perhaps your ability um, to take new products to market? Is it, is it something that's easy and intuitive or are you finding yourselves facing a number of these blockers? Just would be great if you could take a moment and, and respond to the poll here on the screen. And so I mean, maybe it does, and, and Andre, while folks are answering this, I suppose the one question that I do have as a follow on is maybe the minimal lovable product, right? Like, what does it mean to get there? Like, if we talk about like scaling and taking products quickly to market, like how much is enough is enough? Oh, wow, I'll let Andre <laughs> take a crack at that one first. <laughs> a load of questions. Yeah, <laughs> the difficult for me. No, I, I don't think that there is really one answer. I think this very much depend what kind of product you you want to to develop. I think I would always encourage as as always start with with listening to your customer. The customer will tell you what is their customer journey, what are the main pain points, and where to focus first on. And in the end, I would say I would I would also define an MVP or MLP as, as something that is really making making a change to, to customers' life. If, if it's only on the small scale, it's, it's working, but I think it needs to mean something to them in the end. And, and this is what I would like to define to make it, to keep it as small as possible, but to create as much value as possible. I think this is all a balancing act. And as I said, I think try to focus on something that you can deliver in a really time boxed way. And you may also, I would say, in this three months time experience, and this was the same that we experienced, that you can't deliver all the 10 features that we, that we have expected from this MVP. So we only delivered eight in the end, but we keep, keep it time boxed and we still are confident that this was something that, that was loved by the customer, even though that there are still room for improvement as always. And this was, that was that's mentioned, the product is never done. This is a continuous improvement process with the product together with the customer. And, and this is something that you need to apply on a regular basis. The other thing that I would bring in is that we're, I think sometimes we project our beliefs externally. And, and if you listen really hard to customers and the things that annoy them the most it's when the basics aren't done well all the time and sometimes we get i mean my background's in marketing andre's background's in marketing as well you know we get excited by shiny new features and wouldn't that be cool and that would be a world first but andre said it before our registration process was annoying people fix it make it better like just like getting getting the fundamentals right all the time is really important. We, we've made some mistakes in the past. We, we haven't focused enough on some of that foundational stuff because we got distracted by bright, shiny, new, differentiating things. And, and in the process, probably took our eye off the ball a little bit. Um, 
you know, and we're trying to fix that now and, and, and make sure we got the balance right. And we're, you know, with the work that we're doing with Andre, we're, we're reaping the benefits of that. We're making sure we're building in the right level of product telemetry right from the outset. So we're, we're keeping a real close eye on, are we actually delivering on the promise all the time? But that, you know, that desire to over-innovate. My point is what you think is minimum lovable is probably not what the customer really thinks is minimum lovable. So that's no. that's where validation <laughs> and voice of the customer comes in. And rapid in a rapid acceleration and adoption and change to see actually how it's working is really important to it. And so I appreciate that feedback. And maybe we can see kind of how our respondents also felt. And it's really quite across the board, right? We have a, a bit of a mix, yeah. right? There's organizations who do struggle with this and others who have repeatable processes. Um, I suppose for, the, you know, reflect upon your own journey here. Um, what has been kind of the, the biggest, I would say, success factor in, in helping you kind of, is it a mechanism or emotion that helped you to think through what, it, what are some of those key elements that you need to deliver on to bring value to, to customers? So, so I think we did quite a lot of work early on to try and build a sort of value hypothesis framework, right? So just like what's the logical steps that get you from, you know, we've saved the customer time or we've made this easier to do or we can now get more personalized offers in their hands quicker. You know, what's, what's the sort of logical steps that lead you to a financial outcome and that so that does help drive some thinking of, of value um i don't know whether i'm i'm really getting to the heart of your question Ella. i mean it's one of the things that we're putting a lot of effort into is the kind of basket of measures and metrics that we wrap around these things because i think it's um, and where we've got to is that we're trying to think about the success and the source of value kind of at three levels from, from what we do. So um, think of it as a pyramid and kind of the bottom layer is what we'd call transactional, right? So, you know, is it working, right? Do, you know, when, when they click the button, do they get what they need? What are the top complaints that we're seeing through reviews, ratings, or call centers? So kind of low level and, you know, and are they, changing or improving over time. Then above that, we're trying to look at journey success. Can the customer get to the successful outcome that they want? So if they want to get rewarded for a purchase or they want to buy fuel at the pump or they want to pay for the car wash through the app, you know, can they do it? Does it do, is their journey completed successfully? And then kind of at the top of the pyramid is we think about relationship metrics, which is are we making their life better? Are they happier? Do they like us more? Are they more loyal? You know, so some of those traditional kind of CSAT metrics. And what we've learned, I think, is that you kind of have to look at all three. There's a temptation to go very transactional and micro and what's the latency or resilience in the product or almost the other extreme of, you know, what's our NPS or CSAT and much more nuanced than that when you get to value and of course the problem is the world changes because what's a perfectly good experience today changes tomorrow the minute that somebody else starts doing it better than you consistently so the goalposts move every day so you need a, a measurement framework that can move with that set of changing expectations as well so i don't know if that answered your question or not, but. it did thank you des so before we, we soon get to our home stretch, but before that, there's one point you touched upon, which got me curious, and maybe you can add a few more thoughts around it, is you talked about not everything works. Like it's a tough journey. There's, there's learnings, there are mistakes we make. And you mentioned about um, one of the things about focusing on shiny things, which took you away from the customer. What were some of the other, you know, I wouldn't want to call failures, but learnings that you had as you went on the journey where you said, you know what, we would do this different the next time around. The, 
I mean, I would call them failures. It's okay, right? We, they didn't achieve the objectives we set out to achieve. We didn't make customers as happy as we thought we might through what we did. So it's okay. But you, you're absolutely right. We, um, you know, every single one of them triggered a, a learning. Um, probably one thing I'd try and bring out. Um, we, we have underestimated, I have underestimated along the way the level of kind of business change we talked about it a little bit before kind of cultural change but business change required to make some of these things successful again you're in a digital innovation process you tend to focus on will the technology work and what you forget is that the technology is just part of a much broader experience so you know, live example, right, is we launched a, a click and collect service during the pandemic for, for grocery. So you could still go to your, your we did it in the UK and Australia. You could go to your BP um, petrol station or gas station, having pre-ordered your goods and they would be available on collection. So great service, very topical link to pandemic, very valued service. Technology worked fine. It was pretty simple, you know, basket type technology with, with some checkout technology. But what we found was the sort of things that tripped us up was in order for it to work, you had to have an iPad in the store with an operator that spotted an alert. Well, if somebody forgot to plug the iPad in to charge overnight, guess what? You click and collect, you know, fell down. Not because the app didn't work, not because the basket function didn't work, not because somebody hadn't plugged the iPad in, right? And we, it's those kind of operational um, challenges. So thinking end to end and understanding capability change. I mean, we, one of the small example was we did um, part of this customer centricity work. We wanted to create real time customer feedback, not rocket science, right? I talked before about getting the basics right. Um, we, would we just did very simple survey type technology at the point of transaction. So you've placed an order or received a delivery or had an interaction with our call center. And one of the biggest barriers that we had to overcome was from our customer service and sales teams who said, well, if we ask our customers and they tell us that they're not happy, we're going to have to deal with that. I haven't got the people or processes to deal with that. So we got ourselves into this situation of like, I can't ask customers if they're happy or not, because if they tell me they're not, I haven't got a process for that. And that, that was, it kind of blew my mind because there the technology worked perfectly, but the business process wrapped around it was the thing that took a bit of work. And that we learned the hard way that you really have to invest in the business change side, not just successful technology deployment. I think that was... When I, look, when I think about the failures, it was when we got those things wrong. Um, and then sometimes the customer Perfect. just didn't want what we were offering, which is fine because they're the customer. So mm -hmm. That's excellent insight, Des. Um, as we wrap up, we're going to move on to the Q&A shortly. But um, what, before, as we wrap up the session, Des and Andrea is just wondering if you could share some of those key, as you reflect, some of those key takeaways that you want people to think about as they consider their journey. And as we saw our audiences on, um, you know, quite a, quite a spread out spectrum for those who uh, who are, you know, doing some of it already, and those who are who are almost making that start and starting that first step. What would be some of those key things you'd advise them to to keep in mind? Andre, do you want to? Yeah, I, I think I, I can. I can go. For, I think for me, it's first of all listen to really to the customer voice. I think this is so crucial in the whole process. But also not only, only listening to them, but also do it on a regular basis and turn the insights into actions. Because I think we are sometimes good in partly listening, in, but then I would say continue as of before. So really take this, reshuffle your backlog, focus on customer insight. I think this would be my first. Um, and, and secondly, I would say make a start. Be very encouraged to make a start 
to be open to new ideas and to learn also to evolve the process, to adapt new ideas, to test something, test, do, learn, learn with the customer and then do it again and do it better. And, it, and don't be shy to put things into the bin. I think this is also fine if you feel at the end it has failed, don't fall in love. In retail, we always said, don't fall in love with your assets, but it's also here, don't fall in love with a feature. If the customers don't want this feature, forget about it or take it somewhere else and, and test it a bit differently. But, but don't really, I would say, focus too much on things that you probably love. And I think just a couple of thoughts from, from me. I, if I think about the sort of steps that we've been on so far, it's been about building three C's, right? Capability, confidence, and credibility. So capability is you do need help, right? Take the offer of help. We've talked before about the partners that we've worked with along the way, and we've learned a lot, right? I, you know, my introduction to this space came through the work that we were doing with our innovation and delivery partners. So pairing to build capability is, is a great first step. Then I think it's about building confidence. And a lot of that is about the visibility, be open, share, celebrate the learnings you get from the things that don't go so well, bring your senior stakeholders, enroll them in the process by making it visible rather than trying to manage at arm length. And that builds confidence. And finally, credibility, you know, being able to deliver on your promises. We, we you know, have a clear scope and ambition and, and execute on it, start small, let it grow. I, I, there's no sort of magic to this. The, the danger is that, you know, unless you can see a path to this being everywhere and changing everyone, you, you sometimes don't start. Just start, right? Take the first step, pick somewhere, anywhere, stop thinking, start doing, and you might just surprise yourself. So, yeah, my kind of final thought. No, thank you so much. That's so insightful, doesn't Andrew? And it's great that, you know, you've, you've been, you've practiced it, seen it, seen the things that have worked, seen some things that haven't worked. And I think we were discussing, as you said, the job's never done. And uh, so on that note, um, I think we want to go and, uh, of course, give you the opportunity to ask some of the questions uh, directly to Des and Andre, but... Uh, what we just want to, what I want, just wanted to mention before we go on to that is as you reflect upon our discussion today, AWS and ThoughtWorks are here to support you further along your journey. As a courtesy to those of you who have attended uh, and joined today's event, we will extend an hour complimentary product innovation consultation on how you could take ideas to market at pace. We only have a few slots available. Um, so um, we'll share more information around it after the events, but if you're interested, uh, let us know and we'd be more than happy to help. Now on to the Q&A. So we have a few questions come in, uh, Des and Andre for you already. Uh, for others who haven't had the opportunity, please feel free, go ahead and add your questions now and we'll take it over the next, um, next seven to eight minutes. So the first question we've got here um, is uh, from someone who talks about they struggle to prevent, they also struggle to prevent senior stakeholders from asking from year ahead features, et cetera, that Andrew, you were describing. I tried to get them to sign up to business objectives and outcomes, but they push for deliverables because it helps them manage cost, benefit mm. and risk. How do you convince BP to put aside funding for future development? It's a great question and it, it is a challenge, right? We're most, large organizations succeed and grow because of good financial control mechanisms right so it's just it's kind of in the dna of the company to tell me what i'm going to get if i give you this investment the way that we're trying to change it and we've been reasonably successful so far is is really introducing this concept of backlog so you know what andre is andre is not saying i will deliver these features on this date for this outcome what he's saying is, here's my backlog as of today of the potential features. And I think this is what we're going to work through in 22. But we reserve the right to change it based on what we learn and based on what the customer tells us. But we think that, you know, through our processes, 
we still believe we can achieve this kind of value outcome but the way in which we do it might be different and that so just being transparent to say these are the things in the backlog this is the capacity that an investment buys and our process is designed to make sure we work on the most valuable things and we change based on what we learn they you know i wouldn't say they love the answer but it it's hard to argue with the logic of that and, and we're getting some success certainly at the sort of portfolio levels i know andre you you keep getting bugged kind of in the market but i think that's the answer right is try and focus on backlog rather than you know specific milestone andre, i agree i think this, this, yeah i think this is fair and i think this is the solution however as you rightly said i think we are also not fully there yet because as, as said earlier as of today, I think I still have conversation with, I would say, a defined backlog for 2022 with what feature do you deliver when. But it's, I think there's a bit of tension that we need probably to accept, um, always in between people which are not probably so far on that journey. Um, but it's the right, definitely the right thing to do. Manage your backlog and talk more about your backlog and define some strategic goals that you can put into your or your ass, um, to, to measure also and, and prove success that you deliver. I think this is important that you have some kind of success criteria, which you are convinced you're delivering mm. independent which feature you are taking into your product. Yeah, we, that's really interesting. And it actually goes into another question we, we received, which relates to this kind of one team mindset, right? We talk about that being a key challenge. It's not necessarily if the technology, it's not there or it doesn't work. And so I guess maybe the question to the two of you here related to that from this is, you know, usually the IT delivery arm of any firm listens to the business and the customer, but it may not necessarily fit with their remit. And so how are you like maintaining that touch base point or, you know, aligning with the delivery of your strategy to these groups and managing those benefits? Is it like a quarterly review or how are you doing this day to day? I would say when we're talking to about, I mean, you can make it a bit more broader this on, on, on your on your level. But I would say from my, our, our, I think IT is part of our product development team. So it's not that we are, and this is a bit through the example that I mentioned earlier, throw something over the fence to IT, say, okay, please do this. Come back in three weeks, whatever, after your iteration. So we are fully embedded and they are fully embedded into one team. So it's not that, that the mine RL team is a team which is combined of businesses, of people like us helping to get the agile journey been executed, design thinking applied, and about the I and E, our our IT team, which is helping as one team to get this product up and running. And also, as one example, so also I've introduced some some weeks ago a customer spotlight session, which is really about getting the customer voice into the room, also for the dev team to understand what is is it what customer are thinking about our app. Where do they have complaints and pains with the app? And not only, I would say, us telling the deaf, this is something that you need to do. They need to understand why this is important to change it here and there. Um, I think these are two, two, two uh, I would say, elements and tools that I have put in place for Manara. We, at a, a kind of operating model level, we, we try really hard. I do this a lot, right? Think of a triangle. It's not a very good triangle, right? But a triangle model product manager, product owner, delivery team, or DevOps squad is the beating heart of the product management process. So customer success and product success isn't a business accountability or an IT accountability. It's the accountability of that trio. So Andre partners with a capable product owner and a great delivery lead, and together they're responsible for customer success. And, and you iterate, I mean, at, at a practical level, I guess you iterate through sprint planning. Now we, we tend to work in kind of program increments. So we'll, we'll generally be planning over a slightly longer time horizon, but that's when you'll, and that's a collaborative effort, right? So, I mean, that's just, that's it, right? Focus on getting, it's not a handoff from one to another. It's, it's a collective. Perfect. So on that note, I think we have time for one more question. And, um, so the question here is, I think, does you mentioned about the importance of innovation partners and having the right partner in the journey. So the question that we have is how important was it to bring the needed expertise that you needed to accelerate or support your journey? 
really important. Um, and I'm not just saying that because you invited us on a fireside chat, but you, if you go back to that, that thing that I said about to get this program moving, you've got to build capability, confidence and credibility and a partner, the right partner can help you with all three of those things, right? We did a lot of kind of paired learning. The innovation partner that I worked with sent all my team on their internal product owner courses and design thinking courses and just accelerated our development massively quickly. It builds confidence because you bring expertise and you give, you know, for those senior stakeholders, it shouldn't be this way, but it kind of is. You know, when, when an organization like AWS or ThoughtWorks says, trust us, this is the right process, trust in the process, they'll probably listen to you. When I say trust in the process, they'll go, oh, I'm not, yeah, what do you know about process, right? So there is something that comes in both credibility, confidence. For me, the heart of it, though, was that capability build, right? So if anybody does take you up on your offer, and they should do, collaborate, don't don't have it be a we've given you a brief you go away you come back is be it's a joint team it's that one team effort you shouldn't be able to see the lines between who's the aws person the thought works person the bp person in that squad it, it, it's one team. if you can get that right then partners become absolutely crucial in in that mix so and andre i mean you yeah i, I think you're right on this i think live that right exactly so i think you're thinking a year ago, I think I took over the man around product manager role in, in October last year. And when I started, I think I had no experience as a product manager. Uh, I would say a bunch of good webinars and, and online courses. So I had the, the, I would say um, the theoretical background, yes, but I never, I would say, applied it to reorganization. And this is where, where, where Fortbox came into play and really helped me to, to get a better product manager, really being able to tackle the the challenges with the organization and um, with the product, with the customer, to get the customer view in the room, to help to, to also, I would say, focus on the right things and to let other things go, which are probably not important within that process. I think I was, I was, was um, a part of the group which had the 70 features and we, we never came to delivery mode with the help of ThoughtWorks and really moving to design thinking approach and moving into this agile mode, we were able to deliver it. And I think this is, for me, a proven evidence um, that I would say, for me, this was very much encouraged and helping, especially as you mentioned, this, if you're having this more difficult conversation with senior stakeholders, I think you are, so I was struggling at the very beginning to explain why we are doing things completely different to how people maybe did it in the last 30 years, completely vice versa to how we do it today. And, and this is where I think partners always helping you to put this a bit based on their experience and their success story into context. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew and Des, for that. We are almost on time. So with that, I just want to wrap up and say thank you, Des and Andrew, specifically for sharing such great insights with us today. And thank you all of you for joining us and participating in this webinar and sticking that through the end and for the great questions. And we wish you all the very best in bringing customer obsession into your organization. And if I were to summarize what we talked about, get center, get customers at the heart of what you do, make a start and failures shouldn't, don't fear failures because they are important learnings that you need to be able to improve and the job's never done. So, so keep going. And of course, hopefully, uh, you know, what you've, what you've taken away some of, some of the things from today to be able to apply to, to what you do. But on that note, again, thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day or evening, depending on where you are. And please look out for our email with details on our complimentary consultation. Thank you, everyone. Thank Is you, Des Andre. Thank Bye. you, Des Andre. Bye.